Glad to be with you this Sunday, week six, episode six of Sunday Word. Today is Sunday, May 19th, and we are about a month away from summer here in the States. Uh, for those of you listening in other parts of the world, you, your summer may already be with you. <laughs> so many of you are revolutionizing what it truly means to be lights in the kingdom of God, and together we are making days and lives better. My desire is to be an open vessel for the Lord to pour out inspiration and transformation into your lives day in and day out. If you're new to this podcast, welcome. Maybe you have gone lukewarm in your walk with the Lord. Maybe you are disillusioned with the church or or have grown frustrated by it. I hope that you find a path here that leads you to the church that truly addresses your soul. Perhaps you're longing for a deeper and more committed relationship with the Lord. I pray this podcast can be fuel for you each and every day, and that it brings you closer to the Lord and His kingdom, and in Him you find fulfillment. Here is your Sunday Word with Leonard Dozier. Oh, you know what time it is. (laughs) When you hear those strings, you know the story. When I was a little boy, I heard it said that God could be heard and seen loud in the clouds. And this is that time for me to honor that person on this earth, on this planet that can be seen and heard loud in the clouds. They have no idea that I'm going to honor them in this way. I've got a terrific brother in store for you this week. He has no idea. We've been in touch. We've been in touch, but he has no idea that I can see him and hear him loud in the clouds. Let's dial him. Hello. Nate Evans Jr. What's happening, man? Hey, what's going on, sir? How you doing? I'm doing well. Listen, man, I know you had no idea this was coming and is coming, but you are my Loud in the Cloud Award winner recipient for episode six of Sunday Word. Um, Brother, you've been doing a lot of great things, and I couldn't think of a better person to make our award winner for this week. (laughs) Wow. Oh, man. I I don't know what to say. Uh, Thank you. That's amazing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brother comes from my hometown of Pleasantville, New Jersey. He's a self-published author, speaker, actor, and he was recently awarded the title of Best Personal Trainer by the Press of Atlantic City. And I mean, he's uh, he's garnered a whole bunch of accolades. I could go through a laundry list of them. But day in and day out, Nate is inspiring and motivating people to be the very best that they can be. And if you follow him on his social media feeds, you'll find out exactly what I mean by that. His new book, Building Muscle, has received terrific reviews, and in fact, Nate, as a recipient of this award, I am actually going to be purchasing five copies of the book and actually sending them to who you desire, my friend. Um, So I'm looking forward to actually doing this on your behalf. Brother, I see you and I hear you loud in the clouds. Thank you, sir. I I truly appreciate uh, all of the love and the support and um, what you're doing as well also uh, it's amazing um, what you have going on and I really appreciate you supporting me and looking to really empower and uplift others uh, that means a lot to me well absolutely man you mean a lot with which you bring it each and every day and I, as I said in my uh, in my introduction just to inspire and motivate people as you do and you do it in such an authentic way that I think it's the kind of thing that we need more of in our world it's make it's the kind of thing ultimately that makes days and lives better and uh, I applaud you. I applaud you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I truly appreciate the love and support. Um, and I'm just super grateful. You bet, man. So I will be in touch, Nate. You can count on it, brother. Absolutely. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Be blessed. Thanks, man. You too. Let's show Nate Evans Jr. some love. That brother's doing a lot of great things. I support him greatly. He's doing a lot of wonderful things in the community. And he is certainly deserving of this award. Oh, yeah. Get loud with me. You know, the Lord loves people who are bright lights for him. And Nate Evans Jr. is certainly one of those individuals who are bright lights for him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you love the Lord, say yeah. Ha. Ah. Get down with me. Get down with me. If you love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, show him some love. I want to give props 
to Grammy-nominated producer Nana Kwabena for allowing us to use this track. We hear you, and we see you loud in the clouds. Sunday Word is presented by Cam's Coffee Creations, more than just a cup of coffee. Uh, Now, I want you to really, really listen to our presenter's story this week. It is fascinating. Um, Wow. 10-year-old Camden Myers is one of Winston-Salem's youngest entrepreneurs, 10 years old. Born with a traumatic brain injury, Camden faced countless several hurdles early in life. With his family support, he's not only thrived, but opened the first social enterprise designed to create employment for differently abled people in the Piedmont triad uh, at eight years old, folks. Cam's Coffee Company started as a weekend hobby to help Cam work on some of his deficits by serving coffee. He and his mother would set up a coffee stand and offer people a great cup of coffee made by a super dude. I like that. While teaching Cam uh, lessons on math, communication, reading, and problem solving. Whether it's Cam's Coffee Simple Pack or Cam's Special Brew Ground Coffee, this is coffee with a cause. Cam's Coffee Creations.com. There's a discount code, a 10% discount with the discount code Dozier. My last name, Dozier, D O Z I E R. Uh, if you put in that code, you'll get a 10% discount. I will uh, certainly have a giveaway coming up, and uh, I will absolutely be, uh, be supporting Cam. This is terrific. Back in a few. Change. To go against the order to make new, to transform, make a difference from what existed before. What if change could be heard? It would sound like this. Welcome to the sound of difference. Positive music for those seeking to make a change. For more info, visit us on www.urbaninstrumentals.com. From the time you were children, you've been told you can do anything you want to if you put your mind to it. And there's a lot of truth in that. You know, from the time I was a very little boy, I was ambitious and a go-getter. And I had a mindset then and now that I can do anything. You know, I've learned along the way that I can only truly do anything through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. But, you know, I remember... (laughs) I remember winning a writing contest in seventh grade that had me be principal for a day. And uh, I had always believed I could run the school, (laughs) even as a 12 year old um, and and that I had better uh, or that I had ideas to better it. Uh, This led me to to run for student council president in the eighth grade. Um, And a very fascinating story. I. I tell this story sometimes when I do keynote speeches and, and um, upon being elected student council president, I, uh, I began to uh, dress up every day. You know, if I didn't wear some sort of a suit, I'd wear, you know, a shirt and tie with, with dress pants and I carried a briefcase. So imagine me, I was probably, probably like him, <laughs> you know, a little bit um, with that, with that business mindset. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, and I would go, uh, on to be class president in high school for three or f- three or four years, and uh, in my junior year of high school, I was selected to represent the state of New Jersey to the World Affairs Seminar in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I was one of two representatives to uh, to the World Affairs Seminar. I was captain of my basketball team, salutatorian of my high school class, and actually my freshman year of high school, uh, the TV production teacher uh, he came to me and he said, Leonard. Um, you know, I, I'd like you to 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 read the morning announcements each morning, and I, uh, folks, would go on to do that every day for four years of high school. I would get behind the microphone, I'd go into the office, I'd come right in in the morning, uh, go right into the office, pick up the scripts, get behind the microphone, and uh, and read. And let me show you how God works. <laughs> let me show you how God works. Long before my work in voiceover or acting or singing or any of this stuff, right? Um. I was about 14 years old um, when there was a multicultural festival where I grew up in Pleasantville, uh, New Jersey. 
And uh, the resident popular station, radio station in the area was WTTH The Touch. Many of you in the greater Atlantic County area will will, will certainly know the name WTTH The Touch. And um, DJ by the name of Stan Harris approached me and he said, you know, man, you have a terrific voice uh, for radio. And um, now, mind you, I had never done any kind of acting voice acting. Um, you know, I, I was really new to the whole uh, announcement thing in high school. And so I, I had no kind of radio DJ chops uh, behind me. But Stan uh, was was departing the area for uh, a job uh, in the South. And, and he thought that my voice, this 14 year old kid, uh, uh, was worthy enough to uh, uh, to be on the air, and so he got me an audition at uh, WTTH. The audition was was um, uh, probably not very good, uh, you know. Again, just because you have a great voice, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you know how to use it. And at that particular time, I certainly did not. But uh, there's something very interesting um, about that, and I'll come back to uh, to that in just a sec. I want you to remember Stan Harris and that story. My next passion became Fordham University. Um, once I uh, got into theater and got into acting. Uh, Denzel Washington was a was a hero and uh, he attended Fordham University and so I wanted to attend Fordham University and and uh, you had to audition to get in. It was um, uh, I, I had gotten accepted into a few schools but it was Fordham University. I'll never forget when I got the acceptance letter from Fordham. Uh, it was a great day um, and so by the grace of God I've achieved a lot of things uh, with seemingly very few obstacles. Uh, and that would be true, uh, particularly in my younger years. You know, I found that I've encountered many more obstacles in my adult years. You know, I'm more grateful for the obstacles that have come with being a husband, a father, uh, with the career and the rejection that is uh, constant in my profession. Um, you know, all of this has given me a stamina that I perhaps did not have in my younger years and and. I'm very mindful of this when I speak to young people or to my students or to anyone because it, it's it's easy to say you can do it uh, from atop the mountain, but can you do it through tremendous adversity? You know, um, I, I think adversity hit me when in a, in a major way when my oldest daughter Chelsea uh, lost her mother uh, at nine years old and and. You have to understand that uh, when her mother passed in March of 2009, um, there was about a month process to get her and get custody of her. And, and, and so my wife prepared, you know, we prepared ourselves to, to bring Chelsea in and, and to just get her acclimated with a whole new house and blended family and, and uh, new setting and, and so forth. And as fate would have it, um, I uh, got the starring role in this huge uh, musical production that was uh, uh, was to uh, debut in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And there were all of these um, big-name gurus, big-name Broadway director behind it, and music director, and, and it, it was a huge affair. And I got one of the starring roles, and I, I went back to the producer, and I said, you know, um, I, uh, I just assumed custody of my daughter, um, I'm, I'm not sure it, it's a great time for me to be going away for two and a half months to do something like this. And, and, uh, to his credit, he was completely, uh, he was completely understanding though, you know, he felt that, that, uh, the role was, was, was for me. And, and we went through, uh, various negotiations to get to a point where we could make it happen. And I finally came back to Chelsea, who was nine years old. And um, before I could even utter the gist of what was going on, she said, you know, Dad, I want you to go. And, you know, she was, you know, uh, even to this day, she has a maturity about her in a lot of ways. And, and even then, uh, I, I, remember, I remember her saying, Dad, go. And it changed everything for me. Um, and so at that time, she could see uh, that there was something greater in store. And it's really... Uh, really from that point, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, that God began to pour out his favor on my career. Um, should God be the glory. Um, for many of you, your childhood was, was wrought with pain, abuse, suffering, and so much more. It's 
it's been hard for you uh, to develop the stamina needed to propel forward. You know, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie uh, Paul, Apostle of Christ, starring Jim Caviezel. Um, but there is a moment in the film uh, where Paul says, just as uh, we, we see Paul write in the New Testament, and he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. That's stamina. That's stamina. At this stage of my life, this is the real goal I have left, ladies and gentlemen. And I tell myself that I can do it when this wicked, wicked world or my profession or people or just life or my own imperfections aim to get the best of me. I can fight the good fight. I can finish the course. Hmm. Ah, and I can keep the faith. Something about that scripture does, does something to me. I can do it. I can do it. And um, to God be the glory. My guest today uh, has a story that you won't believe. <laughs> you won't believe his story. Now, there are some stories in this world and, and, you know, there are a whole lot of people who have been through a whole lot of things, but when you hear this brother's story, it will truly move you. Uh, truly from rags to riches, he has gone from the depths of poverty to a multi-million dollar career in the NBA. And the reason I love this brother is that the million dollar career means very little to him in the big scheme of things. It is with an open heart that I welcome NBA champ, Kentucky Wildcat legend, game changer in life, man of the Lord, Derek Anderson. We affectionately call him D.A. I welcome him to the program. D.A., thank you, man, for taking the time out to uh, to be a part of the program. No problem, man. Congratulations on it all. It's a, it's a great thing that you're doing. Thank you, man. So to kick off here now, you had to literally run your own life as a kid and, and getting to know you a little bit. I mean, I always thought this was just not only mind boggling, but fascinating. Um, so you had to literally run your own life as a kid. Now, I always say it's one thing to be without a mom or a dad, but you were the parent to yourself. When did that take place? Um, how and what was life like for you at that time? Um, well, I think what happened was when you, you're a kid, you pretty much take on what you see. Um, I saw my dad and mom fight a lot. I saw the negative things that they were going through, what they were doing and drinking and hanging out to neglecting me and my brother, who was three years older than me at the time. Ten, uh, ten years old, I saw my dad, dad actually punch my mom. I saw him. Uh, we were standing outside and I heard gunshots go off. He leaves. He walks out. He was like six nine, so he's like really tall. So he was like a giant. So he walks out, and I don't mm. see him for like twenty something years. And my mom, uh, a few months later, she just had enough. She couldn't deal with it. My brother ran away from home. Uh, when he was uh, thirteen, and I was like, wow. He left, and my mom was like, I don't care. So she was just going through it, and. Once I came home to an empty apartment, man, it was almost like it was almost like a movie. It's like surreal to me. And I was like, man, ain't nobody here. So I stayed there and she never wow. came home. And I didn't see her for years. And it was like and as a child, you just you you, you want to be emotional. But I was thinking, like, well, how do I get something to eat? And I just said, I'm going to go to the grocery store and I asked people to carry their bags for five or ten cents. This is like 84. And I just asked people to carry their bags. And I got made my first three dollars at the age of 11. I got bread and bologna. I made life decisions. I was going to get KFC, and I said, you know what? I don't know. She gonna come home. So at 11 years yeah, old, I yeah. just made a survival decision. What like I was a genius about it. I said, well, right. if she don't come home, I'm going to be out of money. So I went back and got some bread, um, and I got some bologna, and that kept me that kept me fed for the weekend. I mean, I was eating it every day, but I wasn't starving. I had used a water fountain from the park that was across from my project my, house. My. And... And I just survived. And then when you, you start in school, you go and you wash. I was washing clothes in cold water. Um, I knew to do that because I had been taught that at an early age. Like I said, I was watching a lot of things and watching my parents drink and smoke. I said I would never do that because they lost themselves. And to this day at 45, I've never touched mm. alcohol, never drank the beer, never yes, smoked, sir. never done drugs. I never did it because I visually watched it tear my parents apart. So for me, I think I just survived. It wasn't a blueprint. It was survival. And a lot of people in this world, you either survive or you die. And I think a lot of people die because they give up on, on the reality of nobody's coming to save you. 
I don't care if you're an adult, you're 20, you got both parents. Nobody's coming to save you for you to be happy. You have to find your own way. And and uh, I, I asked other people to live, stay with their house. I would clean up yards, make money. Um, I wore the same clothes. You know what I'm saying? I was helping other people were helping. We was in a project. So everyone, yeah. you could tell who was poor, but you could tell who was really struggling. And everybody was like opening their doors to me. I was working. Like I stayed over uh, different people's houses almost every other week. And it was like, I did that for a couple of years. And, um, and then I, at 14, I uh, met a high school girlfriend, a janitor. I used to sleep in a high school gymnasium. Uh, and the janitor, he told me he helped me out. I went over there. I met his daughter. Yeah. I had a child at 14 or 15. She was arrested for shoplifting. So I became a single dad. And uh, I got to an empty apartment and got it cleaned up next to the lady who uh, who had like a semi-daycare. It wasn't legit. But <laughs> she watched kids. She was watching kids. <laughs> You know, when we go to school, so I went, uh, I did that, and uh, for a year and a half, she watched my son play basketball, did class, worked two jobs, paper route, candy store, um, and then I graduated. But it was all about survival, man, and and it and it never changed who I was. I'm all about treating people nice, being a respectful yes. young person, yes, and doing the right things, and good things will happen. When you start doing wrong things, yep. You have to expect something's bad is gonna happen. I never stole nothing. I was like never drank. Never yeah. smoked. I stay focused on surviving, and good things happen. God said, "You know what? I gave you this, but I, I see that you're a humble kid, and I stay that way." And and that's just been my legacy for all my life: is just surviving and staying humble. Which is incredible because um, if you for for those of you um, in my audience who are, are sports fans or follow sports. Um, you know, I, I remember watching D.A. play. And in fact, I, I was not a Lakers fan at that time. So I was re- rooting for uh, the Blazers <laughs> <laughs> a big time. And and to see D.A. play at Kentucky and, and then on uh, with the Blazers and the Spurs and to see the competitive fire that you had. And, you know, even, you know, just to hear you, I mean, you know, and I've gotten to know you a bit and you're you're very much a humble soul. And, and so how did you find that competitiveness out of not only that trying situation that you that you experienced? But also, I think the the great humility that's within you. How did you find that? Because it takes a lot of competitive fire, certainly, to be a uh, to have the kind of career you had at Kentucky and then in the NBA. Well, I knew I couldn't mess up, and I think that's that's the fear of saying because I had a little anger temperament as a child because you were frustrated a lot coming sure. home and you know no heat and like certain things would bother you. Um, but I just said, you know what, I can't mess up. I just my mind, I kept saying, I can't mess up. So when I really wanted to fight or, or do something wrong to the people who were being rude and guys who were playing basketball, I said, you know what, I'm going to just smile. I'm going to play as hard as I can. And my anger just went mm-hmm. to the court. Like when people say, man, you try to dunk on everybody. That was an angry move. <laughs> like it wasn't like it was selected. It was my move, my way of saying, I'm just going to attack this rim. Whoever's there, I'm just going to deal with it. So that was the way yeah. I played. I just played with complete reckless abandon. Like I didn't care about tomorrow. I cared about today. Like, that's how I actually play. People are like, man, he dives. A-. Like, Coach Patino said the one thing. He said, Derek plays like every possession matters to him. And it did to me. Like, yes. I just literally grew up like yes. every play matter. Like, I hate people playing lazy and not doing this because every possession yeah. matter. And to me, that's the way I grew up. So I just played hard and the end results were good. <laughs> Got a lot of posters. And do you think that, you know, the what you experienced as a as a child, do you think that actually, you know, in some ways sort of fortified you for, you know, the NBA and, and just sort of the grind that it is? Well, I think the grind, the grind is just is part of everything. Like I said, it's daily. What would you do? What you do in life is the way you become. Yeah. You know, I think even if you complain and you cry, you point, you talk, you do that in life. You'll do it at work. You'll do it. At home, you'll do it in your friend's circle. You'll do it with random people. You'll do it at sports games. So to me, I think whatever your grind is as a person, I think it always travels with you. So to me, I never changed who I was as a person when I went to the NBA. The grind never changed. It was about doing the right thing, surviving. Yeah. Like, I never went out. 11 years in the NBA, I never wow. went out during the season. Never. Like, you can't get me to go to a club. You can't get me to go nothing. I, I always stay disciplined. I will go get bottles of water from uh, – from stores instead yeah, yeah. of hotels because they were so expensive. <laughs> I was still in survival mode of doing the right thing. Like you go get a twelve case of water for like three ninety nine. You go to a hotel for five dollars. One, right? one bottle of water for five dollars. <laughs> and I'm just like, man, I'm not doing that. That's, that's stupid. And they were like, man, you better walk to the store. Yeah, so yes, I'm gonna walk fifteen minutes to save me, you know, a bunch of body. Like, yes, I'm ready to do that. I don't mind doing that. 
Like, and people thought I was being like, like tight or frugal. That doesn't make sense for me to do that when it's an opportunity to do the right thing. So the grind to say that the grind would just become who I was. Now, here's something to think about now, because as my audience hears you chronicle your story yeah. um, as a young man, did you ever, DA, have a period where you said, you know, I give up. I've been dealt a bad hand, bad deck of cards. Um, you know, you had tragedy after tragedy in your life. I mean, you you spelled out some of those for us. But did you ever have a moment where you said, you know, I, I give up Um this this is too much. Well, here's the thing: when you're when you're living, like there's days that you always think that mm -hmm. it could be some less less traumatic. Like there was a time when I was washing my son's clothes in a cold tub, man, and I was just about to break down and cry. And he came in and gave me a hug from the back, and I'm just like, that's a reason. You know what I mean? Like if you don't have a reason to make yourself not like parents, not like like not even my son just gave me something. Like there are certain things that you need to give you a reason to survive. And I, people say, I'm playing for my parents. I never say that. Cause what if your parents die? Now what are you playing for? Yeah. 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 You know what I mean? So for me was, I needed a reason. The reason was I wanted better. And that was it. Like every day I said, I can't quit cause I'm going to get better. I got a job. So I got new clothes. You know, I went to the little cheap stores. They were like, you know, 30, 99 cent underwear. Like, you know, like <laughs> I was getting okay because I was getting better. And I said in my mind, if I work today, I'll get something better. That was my motivation. But I remember the reason I said about my son was, I said, I got to teach him that we're going to get better. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can't look at it and be like, oh, man, this is terrible. Life, is, life isn't life is always good. I don't care if you're rich, poor, black, white. It's right. not always fair. Right. But what is fair is if you wake up and you get another chance to change it. That's fair. Absolutely. And if I can get a, if he God wakes me up and I can get out. I don't care if you're blind. You can't hear. There's a way to get better. I'm going to find that way. That's so for right. Me was, I stay focused on it because trust me, I had several days that I wanted to quit. Several days that there was drug dealers. I'm walking to the park. They're like, hey, man, you need something? And as bad as I wanted to say, yeah, I couldn't. Because I knew what that lifestyle was. I've seen my people, friends of mine get caught up in that. And I think that was the biggest thing for me was I know what I need to do and it was just, I say graduate, because back then we weren't thinking about MBA and college and none of that in the 80s. You were just thinking about, I got to graduate high school to get a good job. That's what the word was. So I said, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to go get a good job. I had a job planned out. I was going to go uh, work at the uh, craft cashier at Winn-Dixie and I was going <laughs> to uh, get my own paper route because that's what I normally <laughs> did. So I had a job planned out. I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work a nine, I'm going to get here. I'm going to go to Winn-Dixie. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to get paid more. I'm going to do I Like I had a plan. To just do that. Like, I wasn't looking at basketball at all for me to survive. It just became something God gave me. And then I worked hard. Well, at that's it. what's interesting because, I mean, you know, certainly as, you know, anybody listening to your story will go, well, wow, well, when did the NBA or thoughts about the NBA come into place? Because how, you know, and as you just pointed out, I mean, how could you even be thinking about the NBA, um, you know, living in the conditions that you were and, and just experiencing life as you were. So when did sort of the basketball dreams and basketball pursuits come into play? Well, for me, I think it, 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 it hit when people started telling me how good I was. Like when I was in high school, like I became six, five point guard. I had a 45 in the Like I was phenomenal as far as an athlete. Yeah. I knew how to play the game. I was smart. Um, but I was so like naive to the money side or the college like, no parent was telling me sure. until I had my Uncle George who came in and saved my life, thank God. Um, nobody ever told me about how to prepare for college, what to get ready for if you ever made money. Like, nobody taught us that. Like, you know what I'm saying? So nobody taught me that. I didn't have people who were telling me life skills like that. So what I learned was to listen, but to be humble. And also, if you have an opportunity to do something with basketball, take advantage of it. So when yeah. they told me that, I started studying for the ACT after school. Uh, I started focusing on that. And then when I got to college, it was like, that was the word. Oh, man, you're good enough to play in the pros. And I'm like, well, how the heck do you know? There's so many players. Like, I'm thinking, like, how do you know right. I'm good? You know, then I played. Then I went to the Olympic Festival in 93. And I was an MVP and averaged, like, 20-some points. And I was an MVP. Yeah. And they were like, well, who is this dude? we never seen him. Because remember, I never played AAU because I was with my son every year. I had to work every yeah. summer. Uh, no one ever heard about me. I got invites, but no one ever saw me. So they finally saw me. And I was like, boom, now I'm on the scene. Now I'm hearing, oh, funny stories. Portland Trailblazers talking about drafting me, but I tore my ACL the next year. And I still wind up right. going. But, 
But right, right. People started talking, man. You know, NBA scouts, they're here. They're watching you this. And I'm like, wow, that's cool. But I still stay focused on getting a job and taking care of my fun. So it was, I guess it was just something I never realized until I got to college after my, my Olympic festival uh, success that I started hearing that. Because, you know, I heard people talk about, hey, you're good enough to go to college. You're good enough to, they never said the pros back in the 80s. They said you're good enough to go to college. That was a great thing to come out of projects to go to college. Right. Right. Um, I was one step at a time at that point. And when I heard it, it still never changed who I was. Like I played extremely hard. I never thought yeah. about leaving early. I said, man, you should left early. You averaging this. They was going to draft you. I'm like, no, nah, I'm trying to finish. I'm not. I have a dream. I have a purpose to fill. I'm not fulfilling to get some, to make everybody else say that's the right thing to do. My life is to make Amen, sure I can take care of my family. That's it. Now you mentioned your uncle George, uh, was there, you know, any other sort of mentor, you know, spiritually, um, just emotionally for you at that time? Well, he came into my life because once he, he came in, uh, he was always there for us. He tried to help us out when we were younger. My mom just kept, you know, ignoring him. He was trying to get custody of me. He was one of those guys that just had a good heart. He had good, he was a good man. He was a great man actually. And he taught our families, kept our family together. He did so much for us. He sacrificed, he, he sacrificed his life to save our family actually. And, um, he did so mm -hmm. much and he just started talking to me when I was in high school and said, Son, you gotta be. You gotta take care of yourself. You gotta do more. You gotta do right. You gotta, you gotta stay focused. Um, and he just put discipline in me because I had no discipline. And it wasn't like I was bad, but it was like if I wake up at like on Saturday, I wake up at like ten o'clock. It was because I was up late. Yeah. You know, whatever I was doing, I was just up. And he's like, no, you gotta rest your body. So, because I I didn't have to work at the grocery store as much. So he's like, no, you gotta rest. And this isn't that. And I'm just like, well, I need to rest. I want to stay up. I want to enjoy life a little bit better. And he was just like, no, you still got to stay disciplined. And right. he taught me that. <laughs> so he was he was the male figure that I looked up to and I still do. Now, I, on your website, and I you know, get to know you a bit, um, this definitely rings true to me about you. Um, you said that you realized quickly that your purpose wasn't to be the best basketball player, but to help those who helped you. And I, I, mm -hmm. I just think that's remarkable, um, particularly, you know, because I think most athletes, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, I mean, the, the mindset is to be competitive, be the, and you certainly were competitive. I mean, absolutely you were competitive, but to hear you say that, you know, bat, you know, being the best basketball player is secondary to, to really transforming lives and making people's days and lives better. Um, talk to me about, you know, sort of how, how that came into, to fruition for you. Um, was that, was that always there? Um, you know, or is that something that, that basically came as a result of seeing, you know, how much you, you went from, you know, abject poverty to being able to, to play, uh, college basketball and then ultimately into the NBA. And so you basically had this, this upswing from very difficult, you know, from a very difficult situation. So in some ways you were blessed in, in a lot of ways. And so did that, did that mindset come out of that, um, you know, that upswing? Well, here's the thing about that is like, you can, you can say that you did things, but there's a ton of things that happened in order for me to do that. Like, here's the thing. Like when I was dealt the bad hand, I changed it by working to get out of that. And God gave me an opportunity to get places. Like he gave me vision. He gave me sight. He gave me hearing Do people take for granted. Um, so I looked at those things as like, well, man, he gave me, he told me I can get up. So I'm gonna go ahead and work. Yeah. I looked at those things as a way of saying, you know what, this is it. And even 11 years old, because again, I was doing survival stuff. Most people were like, why would you think like that? Mm -hmm. Like people would look at me like, man, you think you don't sound like you're like 12, 13, 14. I'm thinking as an adult. <laughs> yeah, you had to. <laughs> I had to. Like right. I'm trying to figure out, like they were like, well, why would this? And I told my best friend one time, I see, he said, man, let's get these cookies. I said, nah, I got to save up for, uh, for dinner next this weekend. He said, save up for dinner. <laughs> he looked at me like sideways and we laugh about this all the time. He said, I couldn't believe you were saving up for dinner. And it was like in the middle of the week. And I said, dude, I was thinking different than you. You knew your parents was going to, your mother was going to cook. Who was cooking for me? Like he didn't understand that until later. And he's like, now it makes sense. But I was always thinking that. So I never felt like the basketball or anything like that was my threshold to get out. I was always in survival mode. So yeah. your mindset of college only came when it was an opportunity. But I did everything when God gave me the opportunity. What I was saying was, when you go to school, who's helping you? School teachers, they were giving you free lunch because I didn't have my parents that couldn't sign for it. So people were giving me food. Yeah. There was a hand, there was a, a, a village of people that helped me survive. 
Like right now, you can't go do that at Win Dixie. You can't carry bags at Win Dixie. You know that, right? That's correct. <laughs> but right now, for kids in my situation, he can't get help. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. Like back then, there were ways that God said, "I'm putting you in this situation, but I'm giving you ways out." Yes. So that's what I looked at, and I was like, "Well, he gave me this," and and, and it wasn't it wasn't like I was saying to God then, but as I look back at it now, it was because I didn't go to church or anything. Yeah. Until I was a lot older. And, and then that's when I realized, oh, God was helping me do this. Like, yeah. I didn't know. I thought it was me. But I realized God was just giving me ways out. School teachers saying, hey, you need a shirt. You need something to wear. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. They was telling me to stay awake. Make sure you take your study, your test. So after school, I, I studied with my social studies test so I could be eligible in, the, in, like, middle school. And then I got, like, straight. I got, like, A's and B's the next semester. You know what I mean? Like, I went from struggling because I was so tired and malnourished yes. that I couldn't stay awake. And they were thinking, I was, they knew I wasn't a bad kid. They said, why do you keep going to sleep? And I'm just like, I'm exhausted. Sure. And be like, I would sleep good, but, you know, then some days I didn't have an alarm clock. So I would literally have to find a way of making sure I got up. So I would tell my friend to come knock on the door. Like, it was a variety of things that were happening to me that I just realized it was God's way. So when I got older, I was like, well, he kept giving me a way out. People, jobs, Uncle George, like there were people, he was giving me a way out. There are so many people now that have ways out, but they're stubborn. Yes. They're hard headed. Yes. They're, they're, their ego gets in their way. Yep. They won't accept a little hard work, a little people helping them. Like people are so like Prideful. ashamed of saying, I need help or I need financial assistance yes. or I'm struggling. And then it becomes mental health instead of just regular life health. Ah, uh, man. I hope everybody heard that. That is powerful. That's powerful stuff, DA. And you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. And, you know, and I know with the Academy, um, the book Stamina, which we're going to talk about here in just a second, I know that with, with all that you've done, all of the philanthropic work that you do, um, you know, I get the feeling from you that you enjoy the work you do now even more than your work in the NBA. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I love the money of the NBA, but it was politics. It was egos. Sure. It was a whole lot of stuff that was not cool. You played the game because you loved it growing up. When you get to the NBA, it is a business, and it is a ruthless business. You can walk into an office, you and that guy can smile. He can invite you over the house, and the next day he would trade you without calling you. It is a business, and I had to accept that, and it hurt. So this life I'm living now of helping other people, helping people try to get better, leaving a legacy besides sports and leaving something behind that my kids and their kids could benefit from in the future be, even though this world may be up and down, at least give them some peace and happiness to live. Yes. This is the best thing that ever could have happened to me is, is being able to do, to give back to this, this way. I never wanted to be Michael Jordan. I just wanted to be the best Derek Anderson. That was it. And man, you're a heck of a Derek Anderson, man. It, well, I appreciate it, it's, you. you know, as I've listened to you, man, I, I, I'm just, you know, if the audience could see my head here as I listen to you, man, I'm shaking my head constantly because it's such an incredible story. Um, and you're an incredible human being, man. And, and, you know, your new book, Stamina, um, which is a terrific read, everybody. Uh, it, it chronicles, uh, DA's incredible story and career. Uh, what do you want DA people to take away most from it to better their days and lives? What, it, what, are, what are the sort of seminal points, uh, in your book? For me, it was, is to give everybody, uh, hope. Um, to love each other like just if you treat people good i think that's the biggest thing that i want treat each other good man mm -hmm. love people and that becomes a, a feel a feel for you and that's what i want people to understand if you can love each other yes. and be cool with each other yes. and just get around people that actually love like you don't need to be around people who got a lot of money and fame and this and that man they're miserable sometimes Absolutely. they're living off of fame they're living off money they're not good people like if you can't treat the 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 valet guy, the same way you would treat the owner of an NBA team, you're not a good person. I don't care what you say. Amen, man. You are 1,000% right. Like, people ask me, I come out and hang with the NBA and this, isn't that. Like, I want to work there to help these kids. But I can't be around that arrogance, man. They walk in with it like they don't speak to people. Like, I watched the game the other day, man, and a guy ran into a guy on the, on the, on the floor, pushed him down, and, and walked up. He, it wasn't a rush. He got up and didn't say, are you okay? Didn't say, my fault. I'm like, this generation yeah. does not care. Oh, it's unbelievable, man. And I mean, when I check them on it, that's why I want to get to no. the It's like you guys have a platform the kids are looking at. Right. And they don't use it, man. It's like it's sad because and it's not all their fault. No one's teaching them right. these, these morals. So for me, I just want right. people to love each other, man, to be kind to each other. And that's it. Open a door for somebody. I call it acts of kind to of A-OK is just do something nice, man. And then that'll, yes, that'll catch on to you. 
Like people start yes, treating you nice, you'll treat them. You'll start realizing everything about life is about love, man. Period. And I think it exactly. And I think it comes from a mindset that people have uh, uh, in chasing money and not chasing uh, making a difference. Absolutely um, right. That's all. It takes. You know, it doesn't take anything else. It doesn't take a six degrees, a bachelor, or two hundred million dollars. It don't take all that to be nice. It just takes the people around you to be in the same way. Like, imagine if the only way you got paid money is you had to be nice to each other. Poverty would be at all time high right now. We'd be back in Great Depression. Oh, you're absolutely. <laughs> I love that, DA. You are absolutely great right. Great Depression. <laughs> so, the book Stamina, DA, uh, man, this has been so good. Um, where can we get the book? Um, I know I would actually like to get, I'm going to actually purchase a, a couple of copies for my audience and do them as giveaways as I, as I customarily do. Um, where can we get the book? Uh, you can uh, you can go to my site. It's called Stamina. F is in Foundation. D is in Derek. So it's staminafd.com. You'll see everything that's on there. You'll see when I'm going to book. Uh, I do speaking events around the world. Uh, I speak to schools, organizations, companies. Just just about the stamina of making sure you you want you focus on finishing and not focus on the problem. Focus on finishing, and if you focus on finishing, you'll always see the, the finish line. And I think that's yes. the biggest thing. When you get there, you read the book, it's nuggets in there. It's not just a, it's only 185 pages, but I wrote it based upon my life and how I went through it and how I fixed it. Don't just tell me a story. Help me figure out how to fix stuff. And I think that's what I yes. wanted out of my book is how can I help other people fix things and see it from my, my point of view? Then they'll have a point of view of their own and then maybe they can fix their situation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a terrific read. It, it really is. Um, I talked prior to Derek coming on about uh, stamina and what it takes to really have the mindset that you can do all things. You can do all things. And uh, DA's book is, is a great testament to that. DA brother, thank you, man. Thank you so much thank for taking you. this time. And uh, may God continue to bless you and what you're doing and all that you, that, that you continue to do. And uh, keep pushing, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you, man. If I can do it, anybody can. How many times have you heard that? Could we have done what D.A. has done if we were in his circumstances as a young man or young woman? The answer is yes, if we applied ourselves in the same way. So often what's missing from if I can do it, anyone can, is the if we put our minds to it. Now, D.A. certainly did, and he fought and continues to fight the good fight while keeping the faith. What a story. What a life. But there's another ingredient to this idea that we can do it. And you'll find out what that is later on. Each week on Sunday Word, we have three songs to play to highlight our messages and to give weight and meaning to these messages while offering you a tunnel through the rest of your week as you sit with, reflect on, and flush out these messages in your life. Our opening song this week is from uh, my eponymous album, Sunday Word, and it's probably one of my favorite songs on the album. Um, it truly truly captures what it means to feel like you can do it and the message behind it. Um, I pray that you stop your feet, clap your hands, and really get uplifted by this song. Here's You Can Do It from my eponymous album, Sunday Word. Mm -hmm. I've got a message for everyone of you. Listen up and you and you I can see what you can be but this ain't about me you don't have to lay down brother you can do it yeah you can do it put your mind to it yeah you can do it do it do it yeah you can do it Just gotta believe that you can do it, that you can do it, do it, do it, oh, do it, 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 you can do it, I 
I can tell you to your blue in the face But all you hear is when you're just your wear that tub with that Oh, you're a diamond in the rub Enough is enough Aren't you tired of being tired? Sister, you can do it Yeah, you can do it What you mind do it Oh, you can do it Do it You Can Do It, You Can Do It. And that song was produced by the great Danny Fordham. We'll return with the best five minutes of your week next week for the season finale. You don't want to miss it. Sunday Word is presented by Cam's Coffee Creations. More than just a cup of coffee. Uh, now, I want you to really, really listen to our presenter's story this week. It is fascinating. Um, wow. Wow. Ten-year-old Camden Myers is one of Winston-Salem's youngest entrepreneurs, 10 years old. Born with a traumatic brain injury, Camden faced countless several hurdles early in life. With his family support, he's not only thrived, but opened the first social enterprise designed to create employment for differently abled people in the Piedmont triad uh, at eight years old, folks. Cam's Coffee Company started as a weekend hobby to help Cam work on some of his deficits by serving coffee. He and his mother would set up a coffee stand and offer people a great cup of coffee made by a super dude. I like that. While teaching Cam uh, lessons on math, communication, reading, and problem solving. Whether it's Cam's Coffee Simple Pack or Cam's Special Brew Ground Coffee, this is coffee with a cause. CamsCoffeeCreations.com. There's a discount code, a 10% discount with the discount code Dozier. My last name, Dozier, D-O-Z-I-E-R. Here's song number two of your week. It's a song we had on last week. I love this song. I love her voice and her artistry. The song is called I Lift My Soul by Chicago-based vocalist Teresa Scalise. I lift my hands, I lift my heart, my 
Each and every week, I invite you not to follow your heart, but to lead it. These segments have provided an artistic but emotionally vulnerable way to direct our hearts back to God. While the message has been to to lead your heart, I want us all to be clear on just how to do that. In The Love Dare, written by ministers and film producers Alex and Stephen Kendrick, uh, most notably of War Room and Fireproof, there is an appendix devoted to this very task. Backed by the music of Michael Downing and lyrics and melody written and sung by me, by the grace of God, here is Lead Your Heart. So how do I lead my heart? First, you need to understand that your heart follows your investment. Whatever you pour your time, money, and energy into will draw your heart. One, check your heart. One of the keys to successfully leading your heart is to constantly be aware of where it is. Do you know what has your heart right now? You can tell by looking at where your time has gone in the past month, where your money has gone, and what you keep talking about. Number two, guard your heart. When something unhealthy tempts your heart, It is your responsibility to guard it against temptation. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Don't let your heart put money or your work above God and your family. Don't let your heart lust after the beauty of a woman or man. Proverbs 6, verse 25. The Bible says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Psalms chapter 62, verse 10. 
Number three, set your heart. The Apostle Paul taught, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It's time to identify where your heart needs to be and then choose to set your heart on those things. You say, but I don't really want to invest in the right areas. I'd rather be doing this or that. I know, I know. You've set your heart on that in the past and you're stuck in a follow your heart mentality. But you don't have to let your feelings lead you anymore. Lust is when you set your heart on something that is wrong and forbidden. You can choose to take your heart off the wrong things and set your heart on what is right. Finally, invest in your heart. Do not wait until you feel like doing the right thing. Change. To go against the order to make new, to transform, make a difference from what existed before. What if change could be heard? It would sound like this. Positive music for those seeking to make a change. For more info, visit us on www.urbaninstrumentals.com. Our final song of the week is a song I think we can all use as we go into the middle of May. Just wind down this week, put your burdens aside, cast your cares on the Lord, and just relax. Oh, as the song says by my good friend, Mr. Michael Downing, here's Just Relax.
I'll be honest, I'm not always sure what to make of the cliche, you can do it. Can I go do what Derek Anderson did in the NBA now at 40 years old? No. I couldn't do it at 20. There are a lot of factors that go into whether one can be a professional athlete or, or anything, for that matter. The problem we have is that we are told you can do anything you put your mind to. I believe we don't have the true objectivity to process that which our minds should be drawn to. <laughs> Allow me to explain. You know, my wife, early in our marriage, said to me, You have a minister in you. I hate it when she said this. I hated it. Now, you all are family, and if I can be really honest and full transparency, it caused a lot of problems in our marriage. I never quite saw her the same because I saw her as wanting me to be what she wanted me to be rather than what I am. It caused a lot of problems. You see, God had given me these gifts to sing and act and write and produce and all these things, and my career was climbing, and so my response to her was, Don't you see what God has me doing? What do you mean, ministry? Oh, but I want you all listening to think back to Stan Harris and the WTTH audition when I was 14, and Leo Palisano. Look at what I'm doing today. It's ministry behind a microphone. <laughs> now, it's the most rewarding work I've ever done, and I've, I've had all kinds of achievements, and nothing, nothing, nothing tops this, folks. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, you see, ministry to me meant being on a pulpit. It meant preaching sermons. It meant... It had all of these connotations that bothered me, um for various reasons and i and i and i think that ultimately um i put god in a box in terms of what ministry is my 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 i don't chase money i never have actually i chase purpose and my wife saw this before i did a few others did too today i see my wife in a whole new way and it's a beautiful manifestation of what God put together. So I can do this work now. I can do it because somebody else saw it. I can do it. I'm going to repeat that because someone else saw it. It came to pass. Now I believe it and I am walking in it. Yes, yes, you can do it. That which is your calling. <laughs> what did DA say earlier? Others saw his basketball potential. The NBA was the furthest thing from his mind. Somewhere these gifts God has given me will truly be used for his glory. And that message, as the song said, is for you and you and you. So we can do all things that align with God's perfect plan for our lives. There are times I feel that God completely has me on a string. You know, there are, there are things other people can do that I can't get away with. There are paths I take and the Lord shuts the door that works for other people. There are things other people do that I can't get away with. There are paths I take and the Lord shuts the door. You know, there are things that work for other people that work a different way for me. And yet... And feeling like God has me on this string, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I can recall this is a powerful, powerful story, and I'll try to be as brief as I can with it. Um, I remember having to report to uh, Branchburg, New Jersey, uh, for an acting job with New Jersey Sharing, and um, I came in by train, and my hotel was not very far away, so I decided I would... Uh, take a little walk over to the hotel. Now, it was very dark uh, that night. Um, this was probably around 9, 9.30, uh, certainly before 10 o'clock. And Google Maps, oh, Google Maps, um, wasn't very kind to me on this night. And so I'm walking and I'm walking, and this is a very, very rural place. I mean, it's, it's dark, it's woodsy, and I'm realizing that Google Maps... Um, uh, was certainly leading me somewhere 
for which I had no idea. So, uh, surely enough, I, I called the Branchburg Police Department just to uh, uh, see if they could uh, guide me. And, and probably within five minutes, a police officer uh, comes driving up. And uh, in, in that terrain, in that neck of the woods, um, a variety of scenarios could have taken place. And the officer, um, he stopped and he said, Sir, where are you going? And I told him the hotel. And he said, Sir, okay, well, you know, what are you here to do? And so I explained to him what I was here to do. And, and he said to me, he said, well, you know, let me, uh, let me give you a lift. And he said, not only do I, will I give you a lift, but if you have it to spare, I'd recommend that you get the hotel a few doors down because the one you booked had a murder take place a few days ago. <laughs> wow. This is the kind of... And, and, and there, ladies and gentlemen, there have been tons. I could literally go down a list of incidents like this that have happened to me, and this is how I know God has me on a string. And so if he has you on a string, rejoice. Rejoice for the gifts... And calling of God are irrevocable, it says in Romans chapter 11, verse 29. And that's the God's honest truth. May your week be filled with the love of the Lord. May your thoughts and deeds be ripe with those things that are pure and true, honorable and right, lovely and admirable, excellent and worthy of praise. My aim is to connect with you in a more personal way, and I invite you to join the Sunday Word Facebook group. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you who have joined. You can find it under my professional page, Leonard Dozier there. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other. Sunday Word is a Cineplay production. Opening and closing theme music by Paul Kennedy. Sunday Word is available on iTunes and other online major retailers.